we're going to explore a question. What makes living matter unique? Unique compared to what should be your next question. Well, how about rocks? What makes living matter unique compared to rocks? Rocks, we know we find it all over the place. Uh, we can get good at working with rocks. We can pile up rocks to make a dam or a wall. Heck, we can even standardize rocks, make regular rocks. And if we make regular rocks, they look like blocks and we can stack them up and make this aqueduct like the one found in Segovia, Spain, almost 2000 years old. We can get even better at working with these rocky materials and grind up rocks and make synthetic artificial rock or concrete. And next thing you know, you have a viaduct like the one found in France. So what makes living matter unique compared to these types of materials or the types of materials you might find in a mobile phone? That's what this class is about. From a bioengineer's perspective, what makes living matter unique? And I'm gonna offer five aspects for you to learn about and explore. The first three have to do with life as we observe it on the planet. It's most places, it's local, evolved. We'll lift the lid on these three. The fourth has to do with the physics of living matter. From the inside out, how does it behave in ways that are different from rocks and computers and other things that you see in engineering as a type of material? And then the fifth has to do with our time. You, know, you could be a bioengineer in the 10th century or the 15th century, but like, good luck with that. Uh, thankfully, we're bioengineers in the 21st century, and that's because... That's because we have tools in the 21st century that are making bioengineering really unique in terms of how the tools relate to the material or matter we're working with. So let's take the first three and then go from there. We know our planet is full of life, covered with life. What does that mean though? You know, growing up, maybe you heard about biomes, you know, different places on earth that have different ecologies, different constellations or relationships among living systems. You sort of take it for granted, but the main thing to remember is that life's all over the place. Now, what does that mean for a bioengineer? If our substrate for engineering is living matter and life's all over the place, then we can say, well, everywhere there's biology, there could be bioengineering. And the asterisk is there for the obvious, could doesn't mean should, but, oh, whoa, this is pretty interesting. Um, everywhere there's biology, there could be bioengineering. Think about how that's not, like, not even, oh, most people have cell phones, but not everybody has a cell phone. So like biology is really embedded and all over the place in a way that's very intriguing. We know about these biomes, but let's keep pushing it. Like what are the limits of where life lives? Um, here's a tar lake in Trinidad, I think, you know, like literally a lake of tar, the tar is full of bacteria. What about radioactive environments? Can you get biology there? Yep, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, what about boiling water, hot springs? Absolutely, lots of biology and life lives in hot springs. How about, um, you know, a super salty environment? The Dead Sea, it's called the Dead Sea. There shouldn't be life in there, wrong. There's life in the Dead Sea organisms that can manage in high salt environments. Um, in snowy places, buried in the glaciers, yep, you'll find bacteria, other things, sometimes worms. Deep in the earth, miles underground, there's life. How about on a spaceship? Did you know that scientists with the European Space Agency put simple animals um, on the outside of a spacecraft and they survive? These are called uh, tardigrades or water bears. They're not super big. They're only a millimeter or so. Uh, they normally eat mosses and stuff like that, but they're very resistant to radiation. They're very resistant to drying out. Um, hmm. They could survive on the outside of a spacecraft, not inside, on the outside of a spacecraft. We could do bioengineering on the outside of a spacecraft. What is it going to mean when we can bioengineer a creature like this, the tardigrade? Should we be doing that? Another question. So I mentioned radiation. Let's just dig into that a little bit. Um, one way of keeping food safe is to irradiate it to get rid of the uh, microorganisms that might otherwise spoil the food. And oftentimes that can be a good thing to do. 
it turns out that there's an organism that was discovered in the 20th century in 1956 by Arthur Anderson in Oregon. They were radiating tins of meat, yet the tins of meat were spoiling after they had been sterilized by radiation because they weren't totally sterilized. Instead, the spoilage would lead to some macroscopic signal that there was a bacterial infection in the tin of meat. This organism so identified is called Deinococcus radiodurans or D. radiodurans. And it's very interesting because it can survive a hundred times or a thousand times more radiation than most other organisms. Even though its DNA is damaged, it can repair that DNA damage. It's a funny organism uh, for microbiologists to think about. I was reading a paper and somebody called it Conan the bacteria because it's incredibly um, resilient and, and powerful in terms of surviving radiation. But who knew, right? Like even in an environment with a lot of radiation, you could have a life form. Also, when we're thinking about biology being everywhere, we have to appreciate that it's moving oftentimes and causing movement in interesting ways. Could you imagine a plant pathogen that might help to nucleate raindrops or hailstones and move around through the water cycle? Well, wouldn't you know, there's a microbe called Pseudomonas syringae. And here is a micrograph looking at it on the uh, surface of a leaf. You see the opening in the leaf there where materials are exchanged with the environment. This microbe can help with the formation of water droplets and frost, it's thought. And by helping to create ice crystals and other things, it can create damage in the leaf surface, maybe get in a little bit easier and create a localized infection in the leaf. If the leaf falls apart and uh, uh, it deteriorates, then you'll get dust and the wind will pick it up and it'll be blown around and maybe go back through the clouds and rain down somewhere else and so on, right? So, so not only is life everywhere, but oftentimes the life in nature that's everywhere is moving naturally all over the place. All of this provides potential or opportunity for bioengineering. It's very, you know, it's like, imagine if the computers were just raining from the sky, right? It's like, what's, what, what do we do with that? Uh, in, bio, in biology, we see things like that. Um, next topic. Look at this photo of the leaves or wherever you are, like, please go look at a leaf, go look at a tree, go look at a bush. And I want you to ask the question, where are the leaves coming from? Do they come from a factory somewhere where leaves are made in large quantities and packed in cardboard boxes and shipped to where the tree is you're looking at and then somebody staples or tapes the leaves to the twigs and branches? No, I guess not. Um, Instead, what we see is that the leaves on the tree come from the tree. The tree grows the leaves from the energy, the photons that arrive from the sun, and the molecules, the carbon dioxide from the air, the water from the soil through the roots and other nutrients through the roots. Biology is building with the materials and energy that's where the biology is. This is very complementary, or you could say the opposite of an industrialized factory, a centralized manufacturing process followed by logistics and transportation, All right? Stated differently, and I really want you to remember this next turn of phrase. Biology teaches us that all atoms are local. It's the ultimate distributed manufacturing platform as a complement to centralized, industrialized, factory-based manufacturing. Let's just contrast this. Since we're looking at leaves, let's look at something else that harnesses energy from the sun. This is a photograph in the California Central Valley of a uh, photovoltaic farm. These are all solar panels. And some of these solar panels actually supply the electricity to the Stanford campus. So where do solar panels come from? Did they grow in the fields where they're now deployed? Uh-uh. They were made in a factory that makes lots of solar panels and then they were shipped here and then deployed and, and now we get electricity from them. Well, how does that work? What does that involve? You can look at the you know, elemental components of a solar panel and you know, there's silicon. Okay, that's abundant. Let's look at the silver, right? So um, the silver going into solar panels 
is um, accounting for about 10% of all the use of silver on earth today. So where do we get silver from? Did the silver come from the fields where the panels are deployed? No, silver comes from mines, um, most notably in Mexico and Peru. But you can see here uh, at, at a nation state level, you know, where are the countries on earth that are mining silver? And then obviously that silver would have to go to the panel factory and then the panel would have to be made and then it'd have to be shipped to California and installed, right? So, so all of that is obviously very different from a leaf growing on a tree where the photon comes to the tree and the carbon dioxide comes to the tree and the leaf, like stated differently, a leaf is a self-assembling solar panel that grows itself and recycles itself. Right. Um, very, very different. What makes living matter unique? All atoms are local. Biology grows with the stuff that's local. Next, biology has evolved, and we're going to have to deal with that. So let's look at something that's not evolved like biology, a bicycle. Here's a diagram of a bicycle. I guess if you looked at a bicycle and you had a diagram like this, you could determine what absolutely every part in that bicycle is. You could learn about it. You could look at an owner's manual, a repair manual, any, like anything about that bicycle, we're going to be able to figure out what it is because heck, we made it, right? And you could learn how to take it apart and put it back together and make because maybe you made a custom bicycle. Right? So, so in engineering, we're working with systems usually that we fully understand in an operational sense. We know what all the components are. We know we designed the system to be understandable and repairable, hopefully. Um, and 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 so like that's that's what you would normally expect in engineering. But in biology and bioengineering with living matter, none of this is true. We are inheriting billions of years of evolved system and they work amazingly well and we don't understand completely how they work. So, Here's a favorite example. On the left is a photograph of a, a mycoplasma, a simple bacterium that has the smallest number of parts needed for a life form on Earth, about 500, 450 genes or parts, if you will. On the right is a representation of this where all the molecules are carefully represented based on what we understand about them. And at first blush, you might go, yeah, this looks like the bicycle and the parts list. And it's not that, that different in its motivation, but there's a profound difference, which is we don't know what all the parts do. The best studied versions of these microbes that have literally been completely read out and actually resynthesized, their entire genomes resynthesized, there's still about 70 or 80 of the 450 parts that are absolutely essential for life. Like all of these parts are essential for life, but 70 or 80 of them, nobody on earth knows what they do. There's no manual. There's no, just like, there's no like repair kit. Um, we know a lot, but it's not like a bicycle, right? And, and so because of that remaining mystery, when we, be, uh, when we try and be a bioengineer today, it, it's sort of what I would call Edisonian. We haven't made the light bulb yet. And so you just got to tinker and test, tinker and test. This underlying ignorance until we resolve it is going to make bioengineering workflows um, uh, research intensive to a large degree. Okay. So that makes living matter unique. We've inherited these objects. It's almost like an, you, you think of it, it, like imagine if aliens appeared and they were millions of years more technically advanced or billions of years more technically advanced than us. And we inherited all their technology. And it's like, how does this work? And we're, we're figuring it out. Well, it's not aliens. It's actually life on earth is billions of years more advanced than our understanding of it as bioengineers today. And we're quickly filling in that understanding, but we have a lot still to catch up and we haven't gotten you know, the basics uh, fully worked out yet. Okay, let's go into the next, the fourth category physics of living matter. And although I'm showing this macroscopic image, I want to focus our attention on the microscopic from the atoms to the molecules to the cells. And I'm mostly wanting to contrast this again to other types of material like dope silicon semiconductors or rocks or steel high beams and so on. In all those other systems, 
the matter mostly like stays put. The transistors on a computer chip aren't like running around the computer chip. We'll quickly see that biology is very different from that. So we can be very technical. First, we can say that because living systems are comprised of atoms making molecules making cells, there's gonna be what we refer to as thermal noise or random motion of molecules at the lowest scale. And that's gonna cause the systems to mix themselves. Instead of transistors fixed on a computer chip and not moving around in relation to each other, the molecules comprising a cell are literally gonna be spontaneously moving relative to each other and mixing themselves up all the time for free, so to speak, whether we like it or not. Right? Like, that's a totally different substrate to be an engineer within. The next aspect I wanna focus attention on, again, just introducing, we'll have a lot more to say about it, but just introducing it to you is obviously living, we, I'll say it obviously, but, but again, we're gonna slow it down. Living systems can reproduce. They're reproducing machines. We know this when we see, you know, parent to child of any type of creature. Um, but I don't know of another engineering domain where things routinely directly make copy. Like your car is not going to make a baby car, right? The computer is not making a baby computer, right? But a yeast cell is going to make a mother yeast cell, make a daughter yeast cell routinely, right? So somehow the molecules comprising life are capable of not only carrying out their functions in the moment, but they're actually capable of making an entire copy of themselves. And because of that, we'll see a tremendous diversity of molecular functions, what I call high molecular heterogeneity. Um, instead of having a billion transistors that are functionally all the same, a cell might have a billion molecules, but each molecule might be doing something slightly different. And so that means the complexity of function that gets integrated into the biosystems is very intriguing, very intimidating. Um, and, and it's derived, I think, from this requirement of living systems needing to be able to reproduce. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this with, with a you know more accessible example, not just words. Let me show you an example of the first two things and a little bit of the, the fourth. This is a computer simulation of cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the inside of a cell where molecules are moving about spontaneously and they interact with each other and sometimes cause or undergo chemical reactions. And those become the living processes that make a life form. And what's shown on this movie um, which is about 13, 14 years old, is just a section of cytoplasm. And the different colored objects are biomolecules, mostly proteins, a little bit of RNA in here. And this movement that you're looking at is slowed down relative to what's actually happening in a real live living system. Um, how slowed down is it? Well, in a real live living system, the average time, like a bacterium, the average time between when two molecules collide with each other, let's just ballpark it and say it's a nanosecond or a billionth of a second. And so just take a look at this movie and, and, and see how long it takes for that yellow molecule over there, that green molecule over there to hit a different molecule. And, and once you get a sense of that time scale, think of that as a nanosecond or a billionth of a second. Right, so this movie's probably slowed down at least a trillion fold, probably actually a little bit more than that. Um, you know, so so a, a real living system, the molecules are moving at least a trillion times faster than what's shown on this movie. Why are they moving? Um, there's things that are not shown in this simulation, which are the water molecules that are moving and vibrating and bumping into these bigger molecules, the biomolecules and causing them to move, so-called Brownian motion. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> this is again, I don't know how many times I need to say it. This is not what the um, computer chip looks like inside your computer, right? Like those, those things in the chip aren't moving around like this. And if you give this enough time, although it looks like the molecules are mostly staying in one spot locally, they can actually move all the way around. You know, it might take an average size molecule in a bacterium about a second 
to go from one end of the bacterium to the other, just because of this random thermal motion. Another thing you might think about here is how full this space is. You, know, you can't even see through it. You can't see to the other side of the cell. It's chock full of molecules. Um, maybe it's about 20% or 30% full. What I mean by that is the volume within the cell is occupied, a significant fraction of it's occupied by molecules, 20% full or 30% full. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, wait, it's only 20% full or 30% full? That doesn't sound very full. But let's do a quick estimate. Like the room I'm in right here, and there's the door, there's the window, there's the ceiling. What fraction of this room I'm in right now is occupied by humans, by me? And we could do a quick Fermi estimate. Uh, we could say, I've got a room, what is it? Three meters by four meters and six meters tall. So that's 72 meters cubed. And what about me? I'm two meters tall and maybe 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. So I am um, 0.08 meters cubed. Let's make it 0.1 meters cubed. And if the room's 72 meters, let's just make it 100 meters cubed. So if I'm 0.1 meters cubed and the room is 100 meters, I'm occupying 0.1% of the room. Like I'm, the room's practically empty. Um, it, that seems like, maybe I got that wrong. Let's try a different way. Like, let me just stand. Like how many of me can I go side by side? I think it's um, maybe 15 in this direction. And if I go the other direction, it's eight. And then, uh, you know, probably stack two of me in this room. So you could get 240 of me in this room. And there's just one of me. So yeah, actually the, the initial estimate of 0.1% seems pretty good. It's the other approach gives me 0.25%. So, so think of the room you're in right now. What fraction of the space in the room is occupied with people? And my guess is it's less than a percent or two, whereas the molecules inside the cell are 10 times more densely packed. And so how they relate to each other, how they interact, how they get around is going to be just viscerally very different, right? I'm belaboring this because I'm hoping that you imagine yourself transported in this molecular milieu and begin to have empathy for what these molecules must experience. To the extent you can gain that feeling, you're going to have a better foundation for becoming a bionaut, for being a bioengineer. Last part for today, 21st century tools. This is an amazing microscopy movie from Caltech, Grant Jensen's lab. They take a bacterium, they put it in a microscope, an electron microscope, and they make slices and slices and slices of it to see where all the molecules are. Then they take all that data and they put it into a fancy computer simulation program, and they make a cartoon representation of this bacterial cell. Now we get to fly inside it and look at where some of the molecules are. This is one of my favorite bacterium because what's focused on here in this uh, section of the, the visualization of the microscopy data is what is called a magnetotactic array of particles. And, and so if we take just a snapshot of what this microscope can generate, what we're looking at here is a slice of a bacteria. It's about one, one and a half microns long. You can see the outer membrane, which is the outside boundary, that's abbreviated OM, the inner membrane, uh, IM. And then you see those dark black specks uh, towards the middle running left to right. Those are actually magnetic granules or complexes of iron that the bacteria has grown and organized into a linear array such that it has some ability to interact with magnetic fields. Did you know that there are microbes that can build magnetic arrays and interact with the Earth's magnetic field? Um, you know, like, meanwhile, we can see all the other things inside this cell to a degree. The arrow with the letter R pointing at a little dark speck, that's a ribosome where proteins are made. The thing in the middle that looks like this, you know, medium dark bleb, PHB, I believe that to be polyhydroxybutyrate. Um, I think of it as a strategic oil reserve or an energy reserve for this cell and so on. 
you know, so so this type of microscopy only really became possible in this century and is becoming practical now. It's called um, uh, cryo-electron microscopy or tomographic cryo-electron microscopy, where you use an electron microscope to take a series of images and tilt the sample such that you can make a three-dimensional reconstruction of what the cell looks like and see where the molecules are. You can learn more about it via the links and so on. I just want to give you a taste of like, what an incredible time to become a bioengineer where suddenly we can see where all the molecules are as they build cells. The next type of tool is computing. Now we've already looked at a type of uh, simulation of cytoplasm, but what about the molecules? And so here's a, a news story from July of 2022. Scientists use artificial intelligence or machine learning to make predictions for the shapes of almost every protein they could get sequences for, 200 million proteins, 200 million proteins. So I remember when this came out, we were teaching the class. Before the class started, we didn't have predictions that we could easily access for all the proteins making up biology. And at the end of the class, we did because this modeling tool suddenly appeared. Let me give you one more example of a 21st century tool. And we'll use the pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic to illustrate these tools. When the pandemic started in late 2019 and early 2020, infected people through travel started moving the pandemic all across the world. If we use Switzerland as an example, we can look at the public health records and see that the first case in Switzerland was reported on the 25th of February of 2020 and is thought to have come in over the Italian border, which is what this little uh, photograph is showing, the border up in the top of the mountains between Italy and Switzerland. So the 25th of February, that's when the first case arrives in Switzerland. But it turns out that's not when the virus first got to Switzerland. Instead, what happened is the virus is first discovered in China we can use the tool of DNA sequencing or reading out the DNA of a life form to take the genome that's a physical object and turn it into a digital representation of A's, T's, C's, and G's, the sequence of the DNA. So by using the tool of DNA sequencing, around the 10th of January of 2020, researchers in China had read out the genome of SARS-CoV-2, and then they put that information on the internet. And once it on, on the internet, you can move it around the world at the speed of light. Almost immediately, researchers in the Swiss capital downloaded the information and then used another 21st century bioengineering tool that we'll talk a lot more about, DNA synthesis or DNA printing, to take the sequence that is specified to encode the virus and organize chemicals in the right order to remake that se sequence from scratch. So in China, you go from atoms, the genome, to bits, the sequence. The sequence moves around the internet. In Switzerland, you go from the bits and resynthesize the, the genome uh, from scratch using a DNA printer. And that DNA, once you make it, is just a template. So then you have to read it off and make RNA and then get that RNA into cells to infect the cells. And they did all that, all those things, in a laboratory and infected cells in a laboratory and got live SARS-CoV-2 infections by or before the 13th of February of 2020. Now just compare these two dates. The pandemic arrived on the 25th of February, but bioengineering tools of reading DNA plus the internet plus the bioengineering tool of writing DNA got the virus to the Swiss capital almost two weeks before. We can transmit DNA programs by the internet. Lots more to say about that, but hmm. All right, so it's a very interesting time to be interacting with living matter because it's all over the place, because it's local, because it's evolved, because it's got incredible physics, and because we've got amazing tools emerging for measuring biology, modeling biology, and making biology. So let's end with a few questions for practice, just to help you reflect. What's the strangest life form you know about? Or what's the most surprising place 
you can find that life exists on Earth. Feel free to search online. Why do we depend on so many factories? If you go back a couple hundred years, they're not huge numbers of factories. Factories are a relatively recent thing. So why do we depend on them? Factories for making solar panels, for example. And if biology teaches us that all atoms are local and promises at least a complementary approach to making, what must be true for distributed bio-based making to compete in the future with centralized industrialized manufacturing? It's not that complicated, but it's important to think through like, well, you know, if we really wanted to unlock this superpower biology, you know, what would, what, what would have to make that practical? From a systems design and human understanding perspective, what's the difference between a bicycle and a bacteria? And again, I want, from a system design perspective, from a human understanding perspective, can you list all the ways that a bicycle and a bacteria are different? What causes molecules inside cells to move randomly? Something to do with the water? Why is the water moving? I dare you to think about this question as deeply as you can. What tools for measuring, modeling, or making with biology can you imagine already exist? If you just said, you know, I bet bioengineers can measure this or model that, you know, like, like an electrical engineer could use um, the ohm to describe resistivity of current flowing in a wire. Um, we have units for measuring resistance. Could you imagine, do we have units for measuring gene expression or, well, anyway, if you just stop and think about bioengineering, what tools would you imagine exist? and uh, write them down. And, and then if you could wish for some tools, might as well write those down too. That'll be useful. I don't know if you got it, but go back a couple slides. The internet plus bioengineering got a human pathogen to another country faster than the pandemic. Does that surprise you? Is that exciting that you can move biocode around? Is there a bionet in our future? Um, is it nerve-wracking? Is it scary? How do you think about that? 